This is the story of a man who never belonged anywhere, whose backyard is the world, whose ways of life are the dreams of escape for those who want action but never find it. The man, John Steele, adventurer. Cairo, the capital of Egypt. Almost two million people situated on the Nile Delta. Cairo, where the Arabs routed the Romans in 641 A.D. and the modern Egyptians booted Farouk in 1952. Cairo, the city with its hand out, where there's a beggar, a rogue, or a peddler every three feet, and wherever you turn, a pickpocket. Yeah. Cairo, where the natives have that native intelligence, a walk around with button-down flaps on their pockets. But, oh, those women of Cairo, many of them the most beautiful in the world. And so I get to Cairo whenever I can, especially when a friend wires, prize relic stolen, need assistance. I was lying on my back, not moving a muscle. Trying to relax, trying not to move so the sweat wouldn't run in streams along my body. But it didn't do much good. The bed felt like a wet mop under me, and rivers of perspiration rolled off my forehead and filled up my ears. I had a tall, cooling, suffering bar steward beside me. Gin, brandy, mint, lime, lemon, orange, ginger ale, bitters, and ice, all thrown together. I would paid 95 cents for it. And every penny was turning into sweat, quickly and efficiently. I stared up at the ceiling, high, distant, almost 25 feet above my head. It wasn't very interesting, and the flies kept getting in my line of vision anyway. There seemed to be thousands of them, buzzing, diving, sweeping, crawling on my hands, my shoulders, my face. More than once, I pulled the sheet over my head. But then there was always the question of which would be the better way to die, by suffocation or fly bite. I couldn't sleep, kept looking at my watch. Time passed slowly, too slowly. But finally, it was getting on toward the hour I was to meet Atala in the bar at Shepherd's. Shepherd's, the best known, most famous hotel in the Middle East, where Napoleon stayed, where the food is good and safe. I walked along the line of people in the bar, looking under every fez for the face I saw. Finally, I spotted it. Light brown, chubby, a friendly face with a dreamy, sensitive look about it. Atala. Oh, John! John, it's good to see you again. Great day, isn't it? This time of year in Cairo, it is always insufferable, but my yes. You look pretty good, Atala. Well, life is sometimes wearying, but we must make the best of it. Malish. You having some kind of trouble? A kind of trouble, yes. Tell me about it. Uh, as you know, one of my enterprises is dealing in Egyptian antiquities. Antiques? Uh, yes. For museums, private collectors, anyone interested in ancient Egyptian culture and civilization. Mm -hmm. Sounds lucrative. Yes, it can be at times. Oh, thank you. And uh, interesting also, but there the trouble begins. Uh, what trouble? Uh, for the past two months, John, I have been the victim of thieves. Low, despicable, ordinary thieves whom I know must not realize the value of the objects they abscond with. Don't make that mistake, Atala. A guy steals something, he knows it's valuable. Yes, I know, but to make a living in such a way. To steal money, all right, food, perhaps a person is hungry. But to be so insensitive as to steal the ancient relics of my own country, to dispose of these beautiful things for money, probably on the black market. I know how you must feel, Atala. But tell me. Just what's been stolen? Oh, a number of things. For example, some tableware, a few bowls, a jug, two goblets. Tableware? Mm. Well, I don't get what all the fuss is about. Oh, you I, do uh... not understand, John. You do not understand, my friend. Well, I guess not. Uh, this tableware in alabaster, beautiful objects, exquisitely done, dating back to the old kingdom. Old kingdom? Which one was that? The third to the seventh dynasty, 2780 to about uh, 2280 B.C. 2780? You mean that stuff might have been close to 5,000 years old? Exactly. Now oh. you can appreciate the value. Yeah, yeah, antique antiques. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what else, Atala? Then there is a statue missing, a wooden statue of a royal physician dating back to about the time of Pernib. About ooh, 2440 B.C. 
and an offering table of the same period. Table? How big? Oh, I should say four feet long, two high. Well, it's not a large table. No, no, easy for a man to handle. Offering tables were not usually very large. And uh, the statue? Oh, a little over five feet tall, in wood. Mm, not very heavy. No. What about the police, Atala? Haven't they been able to help? Oh, the police. <laughs> you know the police. They try, but... Uh, my age. Uh, and you think I can help? Oh, I am most grateful. Tell you what I'd like to do first. Yes. Have a look at the rest of your collection. You know, get an idea about what all this stuff is that you've been talking about. So as I know what I'm searching for. Oh, but of course, John. And you will have dinner at my home. Be my honored guest. Good. <laughs> I was angling for a good meal. Uh, Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Atala lived on the outskirts of Cairo. He was wealthy, and his home was large and in good taste. His hospitality, gracious and warm. It was cooler out there, and we sat cross-legged on the ground, eating and drinking and talking until the sun began to set across the Nile. Later, he took me to his private museum, an outer building where the relics of ancient Egyptian culture were sorted and kept under lock and key. I followed Atala from table to table, looking, listening, and slowly I began to catch glimpses of that ancient civilization. The easygoing, happy people of the Nile and their everyday life, their homes, their children, their religion. But all the time I was conscious of someone watching. Although I didn't hear anything, see anything, till I turned my head quickly at one point and there he was, watching us silently, almost like a cat. One of those Egyptian cats, his eyes gleaming brightly, following our every move. Ah, Hassim. I thought you were gone to Cairo. Oh, no. Uh, I did not go. Uh, this is Mr. Steele, Hassim, a friend of ours. He will help us. Hello, Hassim. Utterance of uh, Amun Ray, Lord of Karnak. I give thee might and a victory over all hill countries. I set thy glory and the fear of thee in all low countries. The terror of thee as far as the four pillars of the sky. There is none who rebels against thee in all that the sky encircles. What the ocean encircles is held in thy grasp. Uh, what, what was that? A hymn, is it not a thing? On the victories of Totmose. Yes, a hymn. That, uh, Totmose, he was quite a guy if all that stuff was true. It is not well to ridicule the hymns. The deeds of our uh, illustrious ancestors, uh, Mr. Steele. Well, I wasn't trying to be funny. I, I didn't mean to... It uh... is not well with one who ridiculed. Uh, I'm sorry, Hussein. I, I didn't mean to offend. Oh, you are going back to Cairo? You will not spend the night? Oh, as long as I have a hotel room at all, I might as well use it. Anyway, there are a few things I have to attend to. I'll be out again in the morning. Oh, good. Uh, by the way, that uh, Hassin. Hassin? You uh, you've had him investigated uh, since those robberies? Hassin? <laughs> no, 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 John. No, not Hassin. You cannot suspect Hassin. What's so funny about it? Hassin would not steal the relics. He understands them, loves them. He would not convert them to money. Either illegally or legally. Perhaps he does not have any deeper appreciation than I for them, but he has a different kind. How so? It is said that Asim is descended directly along the royal lines of ancient Egypt. That his blood is noble and pure. That it is tied with that of the royal architect, Kapunesu. Mm -hmm. Who says all this? Why, Asim himself. And others who know of him. Well, he sure is a strange one. The beginning of danger and the peace of the unknown. There's much of these when in a moment we hear more in the story of John Steele, adventurer. In Cairo, if you want a taxi... 
You either get an ancient, dilapidated, gasoline-driven relic that belongs in the museum along with the mummies or a gari. The following morning, I hired a gari and went out to Atala's place again. Atala was tied up on business, so waiting for him, I wandered to the outbuilding, where I found Hasin sorting some relics that had been acquired from the ancient city of Thebes. Ah, uh, uh, good morning. Don't mind if I hang around, do you? Make uh, yourself comfortable. Thanks. Cigarette, Hasin? I do not smoke. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'm sorry if I offended you yesterday. It is forgotten. Oh, that little table over there, Hasin. uh... What is it? An offering table. Like the one that was stolen? Ah, yes. What's it for? In uh, the great days of Egypt, long ago, it was placed in the tomb of the dead one. And uh, upon it were placed the offerings uh, to assure comfort and our well-being in the world beyond the tomb. Funerals were big in those days, huh? There was a great uh, procession. And uh, many things were brought in offering. Well, that's interesting, Hasin. Very interesting. It is not a subject for humor, Mr. Steele. Yeah, I know. I I don't mean I'm laughing at the ceremony, anything like that. After all, the funeral ceremony is a serious thing today, still. But this stuff about bringing food... Well, now, look. When a man's alive, he's got to eat. There's no question about that. But after he's dead... <laughs> well, you, you ever see a dead man eat, Hasin? No. But uh, have uh, you ever been dead, uh, Mr. Steele? Uh, huh? Or uh, can you prove to me that the pangs of hunger are not with us after death? If we had to feed all the dead in the world, there wouldn't be enough left for the living. But we must not forget the dead, Mr. Steele. You don't mean to tell me you still believe in all this stuff, do you? Believe? What the one believes is one's own a personal property, uh, one's own a business. Oh, now, look, I... Uh... It is your right, uh, Mr. Steele, to believe what you care to. Uh, it is my right to believe the dictates of my soul. You mean you do believe in the customs of the ancient Egyptians? I am an Egyptian. Yeah, but this is the 20th century, Hasin. Good day, Mr. Steele. Oh, now, listen, I didn't mean to... Good day. <laughs> By that time, Atala had finished his business conference and was free. He was sitting down to eat again and invited me to join him. That was one of Atala's favorite pastimes, eating. As I watched him stuff his mouth and grunt approval of each bit of food, I thought back to my talk with Hasin and found myself wondering whether Atala would need to consume the same amount of food after he died. And I figured it would keep his family broke for the rest of their lives. Mm. You are not eating well, my friend. Oh, I'm not very hungry, Atala. But do have some fruit, huh? Uh, no, no, thanks, no thanks. I, I don't feel very well today. Well, you must be careful of the food you eat in Egypt, John. Dine only in the best hotels, the larger restaurants, and anything that grows near the surface of the ground. Oh, never, never, never. I'll remember that, Atala. There is mm -hmm. much to be said in favor of Egypt. But then there is much to be said in favor of the rest of the world also, huh? <laughs> Malesh. Uh, what is this word, uh, Malesh, that everybody's so free with? Malesh? Mm-hmm. Well, mm, the best translation would be, as you Americans say, um, what's the difference? Oh, oh. Here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> Look, is that the attitude you take about the stuff that's been stolen from you? Oh, of course not, John. Well, you haven't mentioned it since I've been here. I have been waiting for you to suggest something. Hasin. Oh, Hasin, <laughs> John. I told you the idea is preposterous. Hasin is from a long line of... Yeah, I know all about his ancestors. I've got a plan. Yes? Does Hasin live here? Mm -hmm. He occupies a room, yes. He ever leaves? Oh, he goes to the city every so often, sometimes at night. Okay. Now, I figure we should tail Hasin. Uh, uh, tail? Follow him, sure. All right. right. Tomorrow night, until we're sure. Uh, but it will lead us nowhere, John. Hasin is not a thief. I'm trying to help you, Atala. And you're blocking every plan, every idea. All right, I get it right. All right, we will follow him for a few days. Good. And I am sure we will find nothing to implicate Hasin in the thefts. But? Hmm? Well, 
The first night, nothing happened. Hasin stayed home, went to bed early. The second night, we followed him into Cairo, where he sat for a while alone, drinking wine in a decrepit cafe. On the third night, there was a change. Hasin hired a gari. We followed in another. And he led us to the banks of the Nile, where he boarded a ferry. We followed, Atala and I, dressed in tattered galabegs, our faces hidden under the folds of cloth. The Nile. Once, long ago, perhaps the most beautiful river in the world. Today, a stream of filth, full of sewage, crawling with schistosoma flukes and yaws germs, where to bathe is to invite slow, tropical death. On the west bank, we kept a good distance behind Hasin, but never losing sight of him. Later, we were walking behind Hasin through the silent, moonlit streets of the ancient city of Memphis, once the first city of the Nile thousands of years ago, now a dead city. Through streets lined on either side with rectangular, flat top buildings with sloping walls, old, decayed, silent. Where are we, Atala? A city of the dead. A mastaba fears close to Memphis. Mastaba? As these buildings around us, mastabas, tombs. Oh, tombs. That contain the remains of Egyptians who died in the time of the old kingdom, perhaps so oh, 4,000 years ago. Look. Look, Hasi, huh? He's going into one of them. That, that larger one over there. Yes. Probably the tomb of an important noble or official. Atala. Yes. I, uh, I've got the creeps. You are not alone with them, my friend. Suspense and action. One leads to the other. And the result we'll hear in a moment with the climax of another adventure with John Steele, adventurer. The moonlight, bright but soft and diffused, cast long dark shadows on the ground. And the white walls of the tombs were like towering ghosts above us. As we approached the tomb that Hasin had entered, the hairs on the back of my neck began to stand up. And I felt something like a little kid again, seeing a graveyard for the first time. We entered a long, narrow passage. It led to a courtyard, and around us on all sides were doors. Wait. Three, four entrances. Yes. There are two or three separate tombs here. Which one do you think is in? Quiet. You hear? Sounds like it's coming from the tomb on our right. Yes. Well, come on. What are we waiting for? The entrance to the tomb was a great high narrow door, partly open. On either side of it, two giant painted figures stood holding spears, the guardians of the dead. We went through the door, crept silently, and found ourselves in a narrow alley. It was dark. I switched on a pocket flash. The walls of the tomb jumped into sight. The passage turned to the left then. And as we turned with it, I switched off the flash. Because at the far end, we could see a dim light. We crept silently. And then the passage opened into a small room, lit by candles. We peeked cautiously around the corner of it. And there was Hasim, on his knees before a low table, muttering in a language I couldn't recognize. And on the table were arranged bowls filled with food and drink and flowers. There were loaves of bread, a nearly killed chicken, fruits, vegetables. He was dressed in ancient ceremonial robes, and his muttered words sounded old and obscure. I knew it wasn't Arabic. The scene was fantastic, like looking through a picture window back into the past, thousands of years into the past. I felt my heart beating loudly and thought its sound would give us away. But Hasin was too far off in his mind to realize our presence. <laughs> Atala, Atala, what's happening? What's going on? He's saying prayers, ancient Egyptian prayers. Oh, what the quiet? 
Yes, they're all here. What? I recognize them. The things that were stolen? Yes. Those bowls, the alabaster bowls, the cups, those goblets. And the table, the same table? Yes, yes, that is the one. Where's the coffin, the sarcophagus? At the end of the burial shaft, deep under the ground, in the wall up. Uh, you, you see, you see that shape? Yeah, there has to be a door in the floor just in back of the offering table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is the false door, leading from the burial chamber to this offering room. It was believed that the deceased would ride through it to partake of the food on the offering table. No glory, no glory. A tower? Yes. Let's get out of here. It's so interesting, John. Let's get out of here, Atala, before I start seeing 4,000-year-old mummies coming up through the floor. <laughs> if you wish, my friend. We crept out through the passage, slowly. Out through the door, out of the courtyard. And when we were standing under the bright Egyptian night sky off in the tomb, I relaxed a little, breathed the cool, refreshing air deeply. Cigarette? Yes, thank you. What are you going to do, Atala? I don't know, John. I do not know what to do. It's a problem. Uh, he has stolen. Yeah. I could have him arrested. Yeah. And yet? I don't know, my friend. Mind if I make a couple of suggestions, Atala? I am waiting. He stole, yeah, but uh, not for money. Yes. I don't know who that is in there at the bottom of the burial shaft, but it's probably one of Hassin's family. Yes. Now, Hassin, he's old, Atala. Over 80 and senile. A little, uh, odd. Yeah, a little. And after all, Atala, when some people reach that age, the mind isn't as clear as it was years before. It becomes clouded, mixed up. He's living in the past, Atala. 4,000 years in the past. You see, it's, uh, respect. Love. It's making him do this. Yes, yes. I understand all that, John. I understand, but I'm also a businessman. I cannot overlook the fact that my property, part of my life... Yeah, 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 I know. But look, you haven't lost the things. You know where they are. You can get them any time. Oh, if they are not stolen a second time by some vandals from the tomb itself. Well, you can put a, put a guard on the tomb. That means notifying the authority. Oh, they'll play along. Hassim won't have to know. Yes, I suppose so. You think that is the best course? Well, what do you think? I am not sure. Malesh. Hmm? Malesh. <laughs> yes, you are right. Malesh. Come, we shall return to the house. It is time for a drink, some food. Listen. Come, my friend. 